Hold on. I, I didn't put the time on. <laughs> All right, let's go. The Declaration of Independence is one of the founding documents of the United States of America. And although I'm not American, we all have been influenced by that document. In it, one of the famous sentences says that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with these unalienable rights, the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. Now, I think this is one of the biggest mistakes of the Western society because the pursuit of happiness has placed us in a position where we are chasing always the next big thing. And we have made that our life purpose. It's the next car, it's the next house, and it's more money, and it's the next million, and then when they hit a million, it's 10 million, and 100 million, and 100 billion, and whatever that is, the pursuit of happiness. And I think that document has a, a faulty standard because the document is called the Declaration of Independence, and we, as Christian people, we need a declaration of dependence. We can't be independent. Independence is the main problem. In the Garden of Eden, they were dependent on God, they were walking with God, but they declared independence. This is what happened. And I think it's only logical that we will see the pursuit of happiness as being a right. Now, I would like to propose something different. I'd like to propose that the Christian person should live life in the pursuit of holiness. That's a different thing. Pursuing happiness and pursuing holiness are two different things. Now, holiness is a subject that has been sort of put aside in the church culture. We don't talk about holiness as much as we used to. You know, back in the days, 200 years ago, you would talk about the revivalists, the Great Awakening, and they would be talking about holiness all the time. There are accounts that say that Jonathan Edwards will walk into any church, and before he starts preaching, people will be on their knees and crying, trembling, fearing the Lord because they could feel the presence. What has happened? I think the devil is really smart because what he did was knowing that, number one, God is holy, and number two, the church is supposed to be holy, the devil has put this little blinder right here and it covered the topic of holiness. Now, we go to church these days, we talk about everything. We talk about marriage, we talk about money, we talk about career, we, we talk about a lot of things, but it's very rare to find talks about holiness. And I think, to be honest, I think this is what we all need, including me, all right, guilty. Uh, I, I talk to a lot of people who are young, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old. You can ask them the question. They don't want to fluff around. They don't want to beat around the bush. They want the real deal. They want authenticity. And authenticity comes with responsibility. You want to be authentic? All right, pick up your cross. That's being authentic. Holiness. So I want to talk about holiness. And I want to bring a passage to you and maybe in a way that you've never seen before. Now, um, the reason why I'm saying this is because I'm passionate about this area of study uh, of scriptures that is called remes. Have you ever heard that term before? Remes? Remes is a term that signifies that there is a hidden meaning behind the obvious. So here's a tip. Before we read what we're going to read, when you read a passage of the Bible, a parable, a teaching, particularly in the New Testament, if you understand instantly and you say, okay, that's obvious, you probably missed the point. That's how the scriptures are written. The, the, the Hebrew authors, because you have to remember, the New Testament is written in Greek, but they never spoke Greek. They spoke Koine Greek on the streets, which is the popular slangs, the way of talking, but they were Hebrew by origin. So in their hearts, they had the Hebrew way of going about life. And in Hebrew, we don't talk about meanings of words. We're talking about intention of sentences. That's why the tradition of the Hebrew, for example, is passed on from generation to generation when, we, when they sit on the dinner table. Because it's about the story, it's not about the point. When you read the story of Genesis, for example, and the flood and creation, it's not about the, 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 the literal meaning, it's about the story behind it. Where is the story taking you? If you have a conversation with a Hebrew person, at least back in the days, this is what the scholars will tell you. If you ask them a question, they will never give you an answer. They will tell you a story. They are master storytellers. You know who the greatest storyteller is? Jesus Christ. He was Hebrew. He was Jewish. 
and he taught everything he taught through stories. We call them parables. Parables are made up stories to illustrate a point. I'm not saying that Jesus was lying, but they're all made up. It's just in his head. Maybe it's a cultural link, maybe it's something that was happening, but it's a made up story to illustrate a point. Now, knowing that, knowing that the obvious meaning is not for you, that's why Jesus said, you know, to fulfill a prophecy, you will tell them something and they will hear with their ears, but they won't understand. That's the fulfilling of a prophecy. So when people understand the obvious, they go like, oh, that's obvious. So I'll give you an example, the parable of the prodigal son. Have you ever heard that term? Have you ever heard that title? The parable of the prodigal son. How many times I've seen preachers walking on stage, feeling good and say, today I want to talk about the prodigal son. That parable has never been about the prodigal son. You know that? It's not about the prodigal son. We have made this mistake of putting titles in our Bibles. And, the, and, and the, what the titles do, they, they narrow our vision. And we have to learn to interpret the Bible from the text. And the text does not include the titles. So you have to learn how to open it and read it for what it is, with the Hebrew intention of the storyteller behind it. That's a remiss. And then the secret, hidden, secret meaning behind that passage is the original intention. Now, the people and the crowds and the Pharisees, they would understand the obvious. But the disciples, they would come to Jesus after every um, story, parable, and say, Hey, Jesus, what's up with that story? How do I, 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 I don't get it. I mean, they got it. And, but I, I'm not sure if that's what you really mean. And Jesus goes like, okay, this is what the parable means. And he would understand. And then the disciples asked him once, what, why is it that you explain to us but not to them? And Jesus said, because for you it is given the privilege to understand the beautiful things and the secrets of the kingdom of God. So hopefully, you on the other side of the screen, you're one of those blessed, privileged people that have been given the honor and privilege of understanding the secrets of the kingdom of God. And with that in mind, I want to read Matthew chapter 22. That's the parable I told you about that you probably never heard this way before. And if you have, it's okay, it's just another sermon. But if you haven't, <laughs> this is, this is going to be interesting. Matthew 22. Now, this, there's no way to beat around the bush with this, so I'm going to have to read the passage and unpack a few things, okay? I'll, I'll leave the obvious behind because I'm coming from the presumption that you already understand the obvious. It's, it's very plain, very simple in the text. So we're going to read it, and then we're going to unpack a few things, all right? So Matthew chapter 22 it says this. Again, Jesus spoke to them in parables. And some people think that the, the reason why it's parables in the plural is because the author is putting together two parables here, Luke and Matthew. Um, we're not really sure, but here we go. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Does that sound familiar so far? A wedding feast, a king, his son, Let's see if you can connect before I tell you the obvious. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, but they wouldn't come. Now, different from our days, when a wedding was happening in the Hebrew culture, especially if the family was rich, and we're talking about a king here, he would send servants out to the city to the guests of honor and say, hey, we're about to have a wedding in a week, or we're about to have a wedding in a month. Now, in our days, we send the wedding invitations, what, a year prior to the wedding invitation, right? And the only reason why people do that, it's because they want you, the invited person, to have enough time to save money to buy their gifts. That's why they do it. They send it so early so you can prepare yourself. But in that time, especially with the king, do you think the king needs any gifts from you? Of course not. The king is rich. He owns everything. So the king here is throwing up a party, and then he's saying, invite this, this is the guest list. So he sends the servants. Now, in our passage, what's not obvious is that this is the son is Jesus, the king is God, and the servants are very likely the prophets, the first prophets, the big ones, you know, the big names, the famous ones, you know, the Isaiahs and Jeremiahs and all of those guys. They were sent with a message. One day there will be a wedding and we will be united with the bridegroom. We are the bride and it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be heaven. It's amazing. They... To be honest, when they were prophesying this, they didn't even know about it. They, just, they were just speaking the oracles of God. But now, in hindsight, we can look back and we have the whole story. We understand that's what they were talking about. So the first servants, probably the big prophets. And then again, because they wouldn't come, verse 4. 
Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See that I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Now, this second part, and again, that's why parables in the plural, this second part, as Jesus is telling the story, we wouldn't understand it. But for them, because they grew up hearing and listening to the stories of the prophets, they know, okay, Elijah, Elijah, Isaiah, and then all of a sudden, Babylon. Oh, Babylon was terrible. You know, we had Egypt back in the day, and then we had the Persian and the Assyrians and all of that. But the last one, we had Babylon. Babylon was really bad. They took all of our people captive, and, you know, uh, we, we read Jeremiah and Lamentations, and that's where Bob Marley got that song. Oh, is that Bob Marley? No, not Bob Marley. That reggae song, you know, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. That's Lamentations. They were crying because of what was happening? You know, they were getting rid of their culture. They had to learn how to worship their gods. They had to worship uh, how to eat their food, how to dress like they dress, speak their language. So everything was sort of disappearing from the Hebrew culture. And culture is everything for the Hebrew person because they pass on their values generation to generation through stories. So they're like, ah. Oh. So this is probably a reference to the minor prophets. You know, the prophets that were right there in the exile, the last one, or the prophets that came after. You know, there's Daniel, you know, Belteshazzar and all of that and his friends and the fire furnace and all of the so beautiful stories. All of that happens right there and then. For them, for the Hebrew people listening to this story that Jesus is telling, it's very vivid in their minds. They're like, oh, okay. That's the second invitation. It's getting close. It's urgent now. Uh, probably a reference to the minor prophets. Come, the wedding feast is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Verse number five. But they paid no attention and went off one to his farm, another to his business, and while the rest seized the servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. What a shame. And isn't that what the people of Israel did with a lot of the prophets? They killed the prophets. God, they killed Jesus. So, uh, it's a shame. So the king was angry. What do you think that the king is going to do? If, if the king sends your servants to invite you to a party that he's putting out, like you don't have to bring anything, and then you kill the servants that he sends, he's like, nah, that's it, done. Now, we don't know how long this took. We don't know if the king killed everyone immediately and still carrying on with the party, which would be pretty weird. Imagine, just like a massacre in the city, kills 2,000 people, for example, and then, okay, let's have a party now. I don't think that's what happened. But because the Bible is not, you know, we, we don't have a perfect time frame, what probably happened was he put the party on anyway, and later on, because he was angry, he sent the troops and then eliminated all those people who treated the prophets or the servants shamefully. You have to remember, the obvious is not what we're looking for. We're looking for the secret meaning. And behind these things is the, the time frame of maybe a thousand years of all the warnings for the wedding. So, we continue. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Funny, you read the, the letter to the Romans, and then Paul says, you know, for the covenant, it all belongs to the Jewish. Like, the, we can't do anything about that. But in terms of the gospel, they are enemies of the gospel because the invitation was sent out to them, but they didn't come. And some of them actually killed the servants. So that's a, that's a good illustration right there. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. What a great comfort can we take in being in that category. I am grateful to God that I am in that crowd as many as you can find. Because I wasn't invited, but some people messed up and it opened the door for me. I am in that crowd of as many as you can find. You're part of that crowd, as many as they could find. As many as the proclamation of the gospel can reach. As many of all the preachers on the streets can reach. As many as the discipleship process in all of the churches and everywhere else can reach. That's us. As many as they can find. Invite them. Bring them in. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. <laughs> Who's grateful that the bed were included? Amen. <laughs> so the wedding hall was filled with guests, like the palace. It was filled. It was, it was 
It was cranking, you know, the party was going on. Let's go. Like the song that we read, it's going to be a good day. You know, that's, it's a good day in the kingdom. It's a good day. It's a, it's a wedding. The sun is happy. The king is happy. The bridegroom is happy. And we read the book of Revelation, we can see that scene. You know, and the bride says, Amen. And come, Lord Jesus. And we all have, everyone's happy. There's no more tears. There's no more crying. There's no more suffering. Everyone's happy. But, ooh, don't you hate when there is a but in the middle of the text. But, when the king came and looked at the guests, he saw there were men there who had no wedding garments. Now, what's, what's up with that? You know, back in the days, if you were invited to a royal party, to a royal feast, even if it's a wedding, the, the, the historians say that what you would be provided with is a proper dressing gown. You can come the way you are, and as you get to the door, they will check if your name is on the list. All right, Mr. Pedro, you're on the list. Great. Come on in, and you step through the door, and they would have a dressing for you. And the, re the purpose for that dressing is that when the king, sitting on his chamber with, with his guests of honor, would look down on the hall, he would identify, and some people say it was a colorful thing, some people say it was all the same, but it was beautiful, like maybe a royal priest, maybe one of those purple robes, we don't know. But it was clearly identifiable. And the king would take pleasure in showing the guests of honor, look at my guests, they all look so beautiful. Because the king don't want anyone looking bad in the party, you know what I mean? Like if the king is about to promote his party and the TV is coming, the camera is coming, and you know, he's... He's taking the pictures and making the reels for Instagram and all of that. He don't look that. He don't want that to be looking bad, you know. So he's like, okay, let's let's make sure that's good. So he comes and, and the king generally, the king will be sitting on the throne and all the guests will be enjoying the party. But on a royal party, according to history, on a royal party, there is one moment in the party, one moment, that the king stands up, and the whole party stops, and the king comes goes around and literally analyzes the party. He just looks at the party. He just wants to be part of it, like down there, because it's safe now. Everyone made it through the gate. So that's what the king does. In that moment, he sees this guy. This guy doesn't have a wedding garment. He's like, hey, ho ho hold up a second. And I think we can, <laughs> we can paraphrase, we can paraphrase this this way. I think the king came here and said, oh, Hold up a second. Am I seeing what I'm seeing? There's hundreds of people here. I've invited those who didn't come. Some people killed my servants. I, I, I did you a solid man. Like I invited the, 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 the nobodies, the, the everyone and anyone. And you have the audacity to show up in here. And we don't know how he got, how he got there because you, he would have to have the dressing. That's not the point of the story. That's the obvious. But you have the audacity not to wear what I tell you to wear. And that's where I think that we can come back to our point of holiness. You know, what's holiness? Holiness is the garment you put on. Holiness is how God identifies you. After all, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. That's the instruction in the letter to the Hebrews. Pursue holiness. Because without holiness, you can't see the king face to face. And the point of the story is when the king came, I think he turned around, maybe to some of the angels, some of the servants, and said, hey, who, who was responsible for this guy? Who's taking care of this section over here? Who's on the VIP section that allowed this guy over here? No, no one? Okay, he's an intruder. Get him out and throw him where there is fire and gnashing and suffering. And obviously, you know what that is. That's an illustration for hell. That's literally the king saying, you're invited to my party. I made it available to you. But if you had the audacity to show up here and want to behave the way you want it, you don't want to adapt, you don't want to dress the way I tell you to dress, you don't want to walk the way I tell you to walk, you don't want to talk the way I tell you to walk, to talk, you're out. Now, I'm not, again, very complicated to draw theological assertions with one text. I'm not saying that you can win and lose your salvation based on your performance. That's not what I'm saying. I don't think God is up to performance. But the point of the parable is this. There was a guy there who's not supposed to be there, who was there, and he is punished.
That's the obvious. Everyone can understand that. Without holiness, you cannot see God. That's the obvious, okay? We could stop right here and say, okay, that's a great parable. That's a great message. Thanks for the encouragement, Pedro. I will work on my life and I will try to be holy. Okay, so we got the obvious. That's simple to understand. But what's the secret meaning behind this parable? I've got three points and I'll close with it. Number one, why wouldn't the guy dress himself? What's the reason? Like maybe you've been invited to the party. God made it available. God made it open to all of us. You know, remember, go out on the roads, invite everyone, that big crowd. Why wouldn't you dress? Why would you want to play church? Why would you want to play religion? That only hurts you. You know, God doesn't get hurt by that. He can throw you up, if that's the point. But that's just the obvious. I don't think that's the point of the, the message. So, number one, why wouldn't you dress accordingly? Number two, if you're convicted by the first question and you want to dress accordingly, you want to walk in, in accordance with what the king says it should be. What's that garment? And like I said before, I think that's the garment of holiness. It's you putting out the flesh and focusing on heaven. It's, um, there's a lot of things we got to fix, but I can tell you this. Faith is not about behavior modification. That's psychology. Psychology can work on behavior modification. I think we need to work on heart resuscitation. That's what we need. A new heart. And that's what the that's one of the old prophets who were killed says, God will give you a new heart, a heart of flesh. And God will embed in that heart His secrets. Inside all of us, there is a desire to be close to God, you know, to be in the body. We all want to be invited to the body. If, you, if you're out there in the city and everybody else is coming through the body and you're not coming, you know you're in trouble. We all want to be in the body. But third, which is the last and not least, What's the remiss on this message? What's the secret meaning? The point of the message is not that the guy is ejected from the party. The point of the message is that how is God so good that he included us in the party? Because we were not on the list. We were not guests. We were not originally invited for that. But he is so gracious. He is so good that he decided to include you and I in that list. And friends, if we've been included, hey, let's just dress accordingly. Let's enjoy the party and let's make sure the king's got a good time. Because if the king has a good time, we all have a good time. And with that, I want to close this message saying that I want to pray for you. I want to pray that you understand that holiness is not heavy. Holiness is not heavy. Holiness creates wholeness in your life. The holier you are, the more whole you become. No pokes, no flaws, no cracks. Just a perfect reflection of the King of Kings. Amen. <laughs> I hope you've been blessed and I hope this inspires you to live a life of holiness. We need more holiness. Without that, we won't see God. God bless you and I'll see you on the next video. Oh, it's a good day.